everybody. So I'm pleased to, to say that the, the technical difficulties we were having earlier have been overcome. And so um, our next speaker rescheduled is now Daniel Litinsky from Berlin. And Daniel's going to be telling us about Majoranas and color codes. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, a big thank you to the organizers for the opportunity to speak today and also for resolving the technical difficulties. Um, to get this talk to work, I had to replace my Samsung notebook with a Microsoft Surface, which is very fitting because uh, it's going to be about topological qubits that Microsoft wants to build and also about surface codes. And topological quantum computing really comes in two flavors. There's the quantum information approach that you're all familiar with, use topological codes for quantum error correction. But there's also a condensed matter approach, and that is to use topological phases of matter to build more error-resilient qubits. And the most prominent such approach is to use Majorana-based qubits. And it's not just an obscure idea. Majorana-based qubits recently even made the news. If you browse the website of the New York Times and scroll down to the section of uh, news unrelated to Donald Trump, you'll find at the headline, Microsoft spends big to build a computer out of science fiction. And what, is about, what it's about is Microsoft's attempt to build Majorana-based qubits. So since Microsoft is investing heavily in Majorana qubits, perhaps it's worth taking a look at what they can actually do. So in the first part of my talk, I'll try to give you a rough overview of Majorana-based qubits, but focusing less on how to build them and more on what they can actually do. And the message is going to be that they're good for two things. One, they give you robust single qubit Clifford gates by braiding. And two, you can use them to measure stabilizers without uh, without the use of measurement qubits or ancilla qubits. So they have ancilla-free stabilizer measurements. And uh, that's, of course, a great advantage for quantum error correction, and you do need quantum error correction because these Majorana-based qubits are by no means self-correcting or anything. They do have error sources. In the second part, I'd like to argue that a natural fit for, for Majorana-based qubits are color codes to use for quantum error correction. And the reasoning is pretty simple. The good thing about Majoranas is they, they can do robust single qubit Clifford gates by braiding. So if you add a code, you would like to use these operations for your logical gates as well. And color codes have transversal Clifford gates, so their logical Clifford gates directly use the physical operation. You can use braiding for logical single qubit Clifford gates. And it turns out that if you do that, then you can implement single qubit Clifford gates, logical single qubit Clifford gates, without any hardware operations. So it's zero time over it, which shouldn't be surprising considering the goddess Manil theorem. Another thing that I want to show you is that it's useful to combine surface codes with color codes and use color to surface code lattice surgery to implement long range C naught gates between color code qubits. When what this gives you is, uh, is a C naught whose time overhead barely scales with the separation between the control and the target qubit, only with the logarithm. And the last part of the talk is for those of you that care about neither Majoranas nor color codes, but perhaps superconducting qubits and surface codes. And it's basically how to use the tricks from the first two parts to devise a surface code, a surface code scheme that also implements logical single qubit Clifford gates with zero time overhead and CNOTs with this um, log overhead. And that's more useful for superconducting qubits, perhaps, because uh, perhaps you'd like to avoid these six qubit stabilizers of the color code. So the first thing you want to do when building a Majorana qubit is get Majoranas. And it turns out there's a very simple recipe to build a uh, one-dimensional system with Majorana zero modes as edge states, so Majorana zero modes at the end of it. Uh, basically implementing the Kitaev chain in a physical system or building a topological superconductor. And the recipe has four ingredients. You need 1D, spin-orbit coupling, superconductivity, and spin polarization. One way to combine these four ingredients is um, you take a one-dimensional semiconducting nanowire, which has str uh, strong spin-orbit coupling. For instance, indium arsenide has strong spin-orbit coupling. Then you put a superconductor on top, like aluminum, which is superconducting at least below one Kelvin. So all of this happens at very low temperatures. And then you switch on an external magnetic field, which spin polarizes your system. And what you should get are Majorana zero modes at the ends of that wire. And that's basically what uh, experimentalists do. So here are some pictures from 
Charlie Marcus Group in Copenhagen. Um, here they build, they grow indium arsenide nanowires and they coat them with aluminum. So you get this perfect indium arsenide aluminum interface. Then they scrape off their wires, put, their somewhere, put them somewhere else, add gates and contacts. And that's when they realize, okay, these wires don't exactly have all the nice properties that you would like to have. So currently they are experimenting with uh, with different materials for these wires, trying different methods of growing these wires so that you can really get clean topological superconductors. So if you have this, how would you build a qubit out of those? Turns out you need two wires for a qubit. Uh, now you could try to define a zero state of a qubit and a one state of the qubit, but I think it's more convenient to think of it in, in the Heisenberg picture, where you define the qubit using, using the Pauli operators x, y, z of the qubit. These Majorana zero modes at the ends are described by Majorana operators, gamma, which have the property that gamma is gamma dagger and different gammas anti-commute. So that implies that, first of all, Majorana zero modes don't have something like an occupation number that you can measure because gamma dagger gamma is simply the identity. So if you want some uh, useful measurable quantity, you need the product of two Majoranas because two Majoranas have something that's called parity, I gamma A gamma B. And this can be even or odd, plus one or minus one. So that's a valid poly operator. You can define your Z poly operator as I gamma one gamma two. So the other thing you need for a qubit is an X poly operator, which has to anti-commute with the Z poly operator. And you can check that you can use I gamma two gamma three as an X because, um, well, it anti-commutes with Z, which be, uh, just because they share one Majorana, if two, uh, two Majorana parity operators share one Majorana, they anti-commute. And then the y operator is simply the product, which is i gamma 1 gamma 3. So you can check that all of these three operators, they mutually anti-commute. They're good Pauli operators. But you may be worried that uh, gamma 4 doesn't enter anywhere. So what you can do is you can fix the total parity of this whole thing. So the product of all four Majoranas is just, say, 1. And then z is not only i gamma 1 gamma 2, but also gamma 3 gamma 4 and so on. But that's, it's not that important. What you see from that is that one operation that you'll surely need in your experiment is a two, Q, a two Majorana parity measurement, because you want to measure your qubit, after all. So you want to measure operators of the form I gamma A gamma B. But all of the Pauli operators are of that form. So if the great thing about Majorana qubits is that if you know how to measure in Z, you also know how to measure in X and in Y. You can measure the Majorana qubit in every Pauli basis. And what this does is it implements single qubit Clifford gates. Because, um, well, single qubit Clifford gates, Hadamar and face gate, they simply map polys onto other polys, right? So uh, if you know how to, how to measure in every poly basis, this gives you these gates. And this is what's called braiding. You may be surprised because you expected braiding to be something where you move Majoranas around each other and uh, this does something. Well, you could do that. You could, of course, just start exchanging Majoranas between wires. Um, and that would basically just reshuffle the, the, it would just reshuffle the ordering of the Majorana. So it would map Pauli, Pauli operators onto other Pauli operators. But why would you do that? Why would you do, put all of this effort uh, to move Majoranas just to get single qubit Clifford gates? After all, Clifford gates are boring. There's even a theorem for that. And the goddess Manil theorem tells you that you can always track Clifford gates on a classical computer. And you should do that because, after all, doing nothing is much easier than doing something. So basically what this means is, uh, here's a quick example. If we start in this encoding where uh, z is i gamma 1 gamma 2 and x is i gamma 2 gamma 3, well, you could, of course, implement an S gate by moving Majoranas around, implement a Hadamar gate by moving Majoranas around, and then measure in the z basis. Or you could just remember that you should have moved and then check, ah, OK, if I want to measure in the z basis, I should measure i gamma 1 gamma 3 instead what used to be the Y operator. And that's, that gives you robust single qubit Clifford gates. That's the good thing about Majoranas. Now you might be wondering, why are they robust? After all, we did nothing. Well, sure, I mean, you could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, of course, with superconducting qubits, you could also track your Clifford gates. But in the end, you still then would need to rotate your qubit to measure in, in a different basis. And this angle of rotation is, robust, is uh, susceptible to errors. With Majorana qubits, no rotation, no errors. 
the other advantage that Majorana-based qubits have is it turns out that, well, in all implementations so far, if you know how to measure the product of two Majoranas, you can basically use the same prescription to measure the product of four Majoranas, eight Majoranas, and so on. So not only can you measure Pauli operators, but also products of Pauli operators. So these pictures here, here are, um, they, I won't explain them too much, they just show the qubits that Microsoft is currently trying to build in Copenhagen. They're called tetrons, and they're basically these four Majorana qubits that we had before. And uh, if you arrange them like this, then they form a square lattice of, uh, of qubits. And there are, there are certain protocols to measure two Majorana operators, like Y, eight Majorana operators, 12 Majorana operators. And these two in particular, you'll perhaps recognize as stabilizers of the surface code or the color code. So with Majoranas, you can measure these stabilizers right away. You don't need any uh, measurement qubit, like with superconducting qubits, and then C0, 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 measure this qubit. But superconducting qubits, of course, have one major advantage to Majorana qubits, and that is they exist. So a valid question is, well, when are we going to see the first topological qubit? Well, uh, the experimentalists have managed to grow wires. They have never quite managed to get a qubit to operate. And if we ask the experts, then good news. Uh, the uh, Majorana-based qubits are arriving next year. In fact, they have been arriving next year for quite some time now. <laughs> but there are reasons to be hopeful. After all, there's this great effort going on, and there has been a lot of progress. Um, so the point is, we don't know when they're going to arrive, and we don't really know what they're going to look like when they arrive. But I think it's safe to say that regardless of the concrete implementation, Majorana-based qubits are going to feature robust single qubit Clifford gates and ancilla-free stabilizer measurements, because that's what you get from Majorana fermion parity measurements alone, an operation that you need to measure your qubit anyway. So that's the take-home message of the first part. Majorana-based qubits are just like any other qubit, but they can be measured in every poly basis which gives them robust single qubit Clifford gates. And they offer ancilla-free stabilizer measurements. But there are still error sources. And perhaps the most important one is quasi-particle poisoning, which happens when an external electron tunnels onto this topological superconducting nanowire. This tunneling operator involves one of the Majorana operators. And uh, this is going to change your, your Pauli operators. So it's, it's going to lead to Pauli errors, for instance, Z error here. Um, so now you need to add an error correcting code. And I would like to argue that, that color codes are a natural choice for that. And I'll get to the, to the question why in a minute. Just a reminder what color codes are. So these are 666 color codes. Uh, they come in different sizes for different code distances. One triangle is one logical qubit. So let's focus on the d equals 5 one. We've seen them already before. Um, each, so the, the qubits live on the vertices, and each face defines the stabilizers that you need to measure to detect and correct errors. Each stabilizer is a z-type stabilizer and an x-type stabilizer. So there's z to the sixth, the x to the sixth, z to the fourth, x to the fourth operators. And well, we've seen how we can measure them with tetrons at least. Now, the logical information in color codes is encoded in string operators that connect all three edges of the color code. So in particular, each edge itself of the triangle is such a string. For instance, if we take the bottom edge, the logical z is going to be z, 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 product of all z's. Logical x, product of all x's. By the way, here you see what uh, this triangle would look like on a uh, on a square lattice of qubits. So the special thing about color codes is that they have transversal Clifford gates. The logical Hadamard is just Hadamard on each physical qubit. The logical S gate is S gate on each physical qubit. Well, some of them you need to replace by S dagger, but that's a minor detail. Now, um, let me give you an argument why Majoranas and color codes are a nice fit that oversells a bit, and then I'll tone it down, okay? So, my, the nice thing about Majorana qubits is that they implement robust single qubit Clifford gates by braiding. When you add a quantum error correcting code, you not only replace physical and physical error rate by logical error rate, which is good, but you also replace physical gates by logical gates. And these logical gates can be entirely different to 
to the physical gaze. But you would like to, if you would like to keep your uh, braiding operation, you would like these gates to be transversal, so to look like this, because then you can use these gates as logical single qubit Clifford gates. And that's why you can use color codes for that. But before I told you, well, braiding isn't really an operation. It's just the ability to measure, uh, to measure physical qubits in every poly basis. But that's basically the same property as color code qubits have, because transversal Clifford gates simply mean that you can measure the logical qubit in every logical poly basis. So if you want to measure the logical Z operator, uh, you would measure all physical qubits in Z. If you want to measure the logical X operator, you would measure all physical qubits in X, measure Y, measure all physical qubits in Y. So what this means is that if you combine Majoranas with color codes, you can measure a logical qubit in every logical poly basis without ever performing any preceding gate operations. Feel free to be a bit underwhelmed by that, but uh, since the only gates that braiding of Majoranas provides are Clifford gates, this is probably as much as you can do. So if you want to use this for universal quantum computing, of course you need um, the remaining Clifford gate, the C0 gate. And I, I would like to show you that lattice surgery between color codes and surface codes is a useful tool to give you long range C0 between color code qubits. So here we have two color code qubits, a control qubit and a target qubit. And then there's a weird surface, surface code. Uh, so quick reminder, surface codes have X stabilizers, Z stabilizers, and uh, the logical X is the product of all Xs on any of the opposing X edges. So in this edge or this edge. And the Z operator is the product of Zs along any of the opposing Z edges, or actually any other string. The idea of lattice surgery we've seen in the talks before is that uh, you can exploit the circuit identity to implement a C0. So it turns out that the C0 between a control qubit and a target qubit is equivalent to an initializing an ancilla in the plus state, measuring the ZZ parity, so the, the operator Z times Z, then measuring the XX parity between ancilla and target, the operator X times X, and then measuring the ancilla qubit. Okay. So this, um, this surface code ancilla that I have here is uh, it has a Z edge, which is right on the other side of the control qubit, then an X edge, which is right on the other side of the target qubit, then a Z edge, and an X edge. So now I want to uh, implement this protocol. First thing I need to do is, well, I, need, I actually need to measure, I actually need to measure parity operators of logical operators. So I need to measure logical Z times logical Z, which is a highly non-local operator. And, sur and lattice surgery is just a trick to do that with just local measurements, right? Um, so for instance, you need to measure the z to the 10th operator, which is non-local. First thing you do is uh, you, can, you can merge the x stabilizers uh, along the edges. So here's a two qubit x stabilizer, here's a four qubit x stabilizer, you just merge them, right? But that doesn't give you any information in itself because that's just a product of stabilizers that you've known before. So from this operation, you gain no information at all. The next thing that you do is you introduce new Z stabilizers. So there's one, there's one, there's one. And if you check now, you're left with a code where all stabilizers commute again. So that's a, that's a code. But uh, the number of stabilizers has increased by one because we've lost two stabilizers when merging and we've gained three when, when, uh, when inventing these new stabilizers. So the number of stabilizers has increased by one, which means that the number of degrees of freedom has reduced by one. Or in other words, we measure one bit of information. And what is this information? Well, it's the product of these non-trivial stabilizers, which is Z times Z. And this trick you can use all over again to measure all kinds of string, uh, products of string oper operators. You can uh, then do lattice surgery to measure x times x, and then measure the ancilla qubit, and you're done. So why surface codes? Well, the good thing about surface codes is that they have opposing z edges, so you can make them long. If I now have a control qubit and a target qubit, which are far away from each other, 
Well, I can now initialize an ancilla qubit, which is next to the target, but I would need to somehow measure the ZZ parity between control and ancilla. What I can do is I can just initialize a very long surface code ancilla in between and measure ZZ times ZZ, which is going to give me exactly what I need. Then measure the XX parity, and I'm done. And this gives you a, a long range C0, where the, it, in basically the same time as a nearest neighbor C0, well, actually, it's, it's a log overhead if you check, um, and a space overhead which is linear, or S log S. You can also do that with multi target C0. In, for multi target C0 with basically the same time overhead as, as single C0. Um, by initializing more ancillas. So you can measure many ZZ parities simultaneously, measure many XX parities simultaneously, and this is going to give you multi target C knots between color code qubits. So th this trick basically gives you a 2D lattice of, of color code qubits with long range connectivity. So here I have some arrangement of, uh, of color codes qubit of color code qubits and blocks of six on a square lattice. And you can just initialize ancilla qubits between in between to get long range multi-target C not gates between any pair of, of, of color code qubits. So this is the end of the second part. Um, the important message here is that well Myranas and color codes go well together in the sense that you can uh, exploit braiding on the logical level, and that surface to color code lattice surgery is a useful tool for long range multi target C not gates between color code qubits if you use lattice surgery. So now you might say, well, that's nice, but um, color, code, color codes are difficult to implement with, with architectures where you would like to keep the stabilizers small, like for superconducting qubits. So can we do the same thing with surface code qubits instead? And the answer is yes, but um, it's a bit more tricky because in contrast to color code qubits, surface code qubits don't have transversal Clifford gates. So you can measure them in the logical Z basis by measuring all physical qubits in Z, measure them in the logical X basis by measuring all physical qubits in X, but measuring in Y, well, that's a bit more tricky. Um, but I would like to argue that you can still avoid um, explicitly doing single qubit Clifford case. Just track them. And that is, um, okay, so in the, in the following, I'll, I'll use these qubits where just, it's, there's just, I mean, it's basically the same surface code qubit, but there's an X edge and a Z edge on the same side of the qubit. So one thing we'll have to figure out is how to measure in Y. And another thing that we'll have to figure out uh, if when you're doing C0 gates, then this involves ZZ parity measurements and XX parity measurements. So it's exactly the same thing as before. I measure Z times Z, X times X, and I'm done. But if I want to weasel out of single qubit Clifford gates, I will also need to be able to measure operators like X times Y and X times Z instead of X times X, and also Z times Y. But it turns out there's actually this can be done exactly the same way as before. Um, so he here we have long range C0 gates, the same uh, as, as with the color codes. Here's a control qubit, here's a target qubit. I initialize a long ancilla and a short ancilla. Now, this operation is this XX parity measurement. So let's just focus on that for a minute. Um, if I want to avoid single qubit Clifford gates, I will have to replace XX parity measurements by X times Z and also X times Y in some cases. But this you can do exactly the same way as the XX parity measurements. So for the XX parity measurements, you merge these uh, two qubit Z stabilizers, and then the ZZ parity is just the product of these orange things. But you can do XZ exactly the same way. Just move your and just initialize your ancilla opposite to the Z edge instead. Then merge these stabilizers, and then introduce new ones, and the product of these three is going to give you the X times Z parity. Um, 
So it, it works exactly the same way. It's just that the stabilizer configuration looks a bit more funny. It's a dislocation line. And x times y is perhaps the more interesting case because there's no y edge in the, uh, in the surface code pivot. But of course, y is just the product of x and z. So if I have some lattice surgery which involves all three edges, so x, z, and ancilla x, then it's going to give me x times y. And again, I just merge, introduce new stabilizers, and that's that. The, um, perhaps some will recognize that this stabilizer configuration corresponds to a twist defect. And there's no coincidence. Because, um, well, it turns out that lattice surgery is basically the same thing as a, four, as, a, as a measurement of the parity of four twist defects. And this twist defect is simply the one twist defect which is not part of the, of the measurement. But th that's more of a fun fact. OK, so um, with that, you can also solve our initial problem, how to measure in, y, in the y basis without doing anything. Well, you, can, you still have to do something. You can initialize a, an ancilla in the zero state and then measure y times z. y times z works exactly the same, thing as, uh, exactly the same way as x times y. This, of course, you can also use for multi-target knots with also log time overhead, um, s log as space overhead. Um, and you can also arrange the surface code qubits in 2D. Um, so here I, um, here I replaced these, these wide qubits by qubits that encode the information a bit more, uh, in a bit more compact way, because they uh, encode two qubits and with using the same space. So again, I have blocks of six qubits, and um, I can initialize ancillas in between qubit blocks to get, to get long range C0 gates. And I can do them in parallel, too. Um, so you might be wondering, oh, OK. So an, another thing that you need, of course, is um, to be fully universal, you still need magic state distillation. Um, so Cody mentioned before that magic state distillation takes, uh, takes hundreds, of, of hundreds of logical gates to implement. And that's true, but you can, you can do many of them in parallel. So for instance, for the 15 to 1 uh, lattice surgery protocol, which is apparently also a 5 to 1, you can, um, well, it just, it's, it just consists of five multi-target C0 gates. And you can do them in five consecutive steps. Um, you can perform a multi-target C0 involving the first uh, qubit as, an, uh, as a control, then third, fifth, seventh, ninth, eleventh, thirteenth, fifteenth as a target, and the same way you can do all other ones. Okay, it's not, it's not, um, it's not very surprising. So you may, might ask yourself, well, well, what's the entire point? After all, <coughs> For someone who in the beginning said that Clifford gates are boring, I spent an awful lot of time talking about Clifford gates. And it's true that you can track all Clifford gates. I mean, you could also avoid doing C0 gates, logical C0 gates, and just track them. But in the end, if you get a circuit consisting of Clifford gates and measurements, and if you have magic states, then all your circuits are going to be Clifford gates and measurements. If you start tracking all Clifford gates, you will map local Pauli operators onto non-local ones, because the C0 doesn't preserve the locality. So in the end, for instance, this circuit, this some random circuit, is going to translate into the measurement of z times y times z times, uh, times x, so a four-qubit Pauli operator, and some products of two Paulis and some single Paulis. But these Pauli product operators, you can measure with multi-target C0. So each time you, uh, you encounter a poly product that you need to measure, it doesn't matter if it's local or non-local. Because if you're working with logical qubits, then the locality isn't a constraint, because you can do multi-target C0, which are long range. And it costs practically, it, it just has this logarithmic overhead. So in the end, if you want to build a fast quantum computer, 
you probably shouldn't worry about Clifford Gates, as everyone already suspected. What you should worry about is getting fast, uh, get, is distilling magic states fast and optimizing circuits to require as few measurements as possible and also to parallelize measurements as much as possible. And every T gate corresponds to a measurement because it requires state injection. Um, so another thing you might ask yourself, well, is there still any use to the color code scheme that I presented earlier? After all, you can do everything with surface codes. And yes, there is still something that uh, color codes give you, and that is that they require fewer qubits for the same code distance. Also, um, with surface code qubits, you still need to, to go this, um, well, you, you can only measure Y operators indirectly through this um, lattice surgery protocol. But with color code qubits, all measurements are fast. So it's not that much that color codes give you, but I guess if you have a hardware where six qubit stabilizers are not much more difficult to measure than four qubit stabilizers, as might be the case with Majorana-based qubits because they don't require ancillas, then you can go for color codes and you actually gain something. But if it is more difficult, like um, perhaps with superconducting qubits, then surface codes are the safer choice. Well, I'm a bit faster than I expected. <laughs> um, but that's the end of the, of, the, of the third part. And the take home message here is that Clifford Cates can always be avoided, which is of course nothing new because that's been known for a very long time that the goddess man nil theorem uh, tells you that you can always track them. But he here I, sh I want to show you explicitly how to do that with logical qubits. And in the end, if you track all Clifford gates, then your circuit reduces to just poly product measurements and resource state distillation. Not only magic states for T gates, but, well, more usefully, magic states for any non Clifford gate. On that last slide, um, I would like to credit my collaborators and advertise. Um, I advertise my work. No need to cite any of this. Everyone knows that the important metric is the number of upvotes on PsiRate, and also perhaps the number of likes on this YouTube video. <laughs> um, so this work was done with Felix von Oppen, Jens Eisert, and Markus Kesselring, who's, even, uh, he's, who's also here in the audience. And Markus has prepared a very interesting poster on twists in color codes. So if you see a big poster that looks like a huge color code, then you should take a look at it. So if you want to, um, if you want to read more about the combination of Majorana-based qubits and color codes, you should read uh, Combining Topological Hardware and Topological Software, blah, blah, blah. It's the first paper which features the word topological three times in its title. If you want to know more about tetrons and color-to-surface code lattice surgery, then you'll find that here. And for, for this um, surface code scheme, which avoids Clifford gates entirely, it's lattice surgery with a twist. And with that, I've reached my conclusion much faster than I anticipated, but I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. The first question can be the one nearest to me. Thank you. So I have a question. So you are using these long strips of of surface code mm -hmm. for long distance measurements. And do I understand correctly that you take log S by S, where, so basically the distance is log S of this code. So ah. the, the question is, you are losing, you know, perhaps you're able to make the prefactor big, you perhaps it's possible to keep the threshold, you know, where it was for the original surface code. But because the, this code has a logarithmic distance, you will have a very terrible scaling with the size. So there are sort of errors where even though you are below the threshold technically, but you're sort of, you, you will get finite size scaling, which is terrible. And basically with logarithmic codes, you cannot do much. This is the, the sort of the, the message that unless you scale it very, very, to very, very high sizes, 
So I think, um, well, you're right, of course. If, if I make the surface code ancilla, perhaps that's not quite what you said. But if, if I make the surface code ancilla long, then I should expect more errors to happen. And the dangerous errors are those that, uh, that are vertical strings through the code, right? And the number of possible strings increases linearly with, with, with the length of the qubit. But these strings are suppressed exponentially in the width. So to suppress my errors, I only need to increase the width with the logarithm of the code. And that's why I have s for the length and log s for the width. This is average count. But if when you, uh, this is average count, but if you count the probability of an error, mm -hmm. there will be, uh, there will always be sort of, you know, below, above this average count, you will always have random errors that will spoil you the scaling. What kind of errors do you mean? The regular errors. I mean, uh, the sh all strings that don't connect vertically are strings that are I mean, much longer. If you ever did the simulation with the logarithmic distance code, for example, these uh, hyper hyperbolic codes, you will have realized that you know there are you know huge errors, even though you have to be well, well far below the threshold to drive the error rate down. So this is the big problem with logarithmic distance codes. Mm -hmm. Although I, I still don't quite see the the source of the error here. Okay, we, we should talk about this. Yes. So if one wants to build a code on, on top of a system of Majoranas, there, there are two ways you could proceed. One would be to encode qubits using the Majoranas and then use a qubit code on top, mm -hmm. which is what you've described. Another possible approach is to use Majorana codes where the stabilizer generators are fermionic parity operators for sets of Majoranas that are mutually commuting, which on the face of it seems more space efficient. Is there a clear reason to prefer the former approach over the latter? So I haven't checked whether they're more space efficient, but in the end they operate the same way. I could of course translate any bosonic code into a Majorana code just by replacing the Z operator by two Majoranas, the X Majorana. Right, but not the reverse, right? But not the reverse, that's right. Um, there have been lots of proposals for, for small Majorana fermion codes. So perhaps it's useful if you want to keep your qubit small, but then um, that's a good storage. How do you do gates on that? That's another question. But that's, of course, worth looking into. It's just that for surface codes and color codes, we already know how to do it. And there are very many sophisticated tools. Another question. What's the question? Yeah, just wondering if you'd simulated the performance of the color codes with this kind of error model, this type of underlying qubit. You mean with Majorana-based qubits? With decoding. I mean, one thing that always concerns me with the color codes is it's just harder to decode. It's oh, not right. easy to get the full code distance. Okay, so um, I have not, but um, okay, for the surface code scheme, it's just decoding surface codes, right? For the color code scheme, I think that would be something that, that, someone, that one should look into, how to decode this qubit that you get as a combination of color code and surface code. Decoding single color codes is probably not a problem because they're always finite size and you need to do the same thing for every triangle. But uh, for the intermediate state that you get in lattice surgery, I think um, you need to be careful about what happens here. The rest of the code is just a big surface code, so that should be fine. Hi, uh, so you've got these uh, Majorana qubits and you can measure in all the poly bases and you're looking for a code to put around and you said, oh, color codes, they seem to work, but you, maybe you like surface codes better. And you said, well, we have this problem we can't measure in the Y basis. So you came up with this construction where you have these XZ sides and use larger surface codes than you would normally use, but they have this dislocation defect in it, which Hector Bauman calls a twist, mm -hmm. that allows you to do this. And you say, well, we've got a solution, but it uses more resources than the color code, so, oh, well, that's not so great. Well, if you really like Majoranas and you really like surface codes, perhaps you should look at a different kind of frustration in a lattice and a dislocation. You could look at what's called a disclination uh, defect, which is a rotational defect, mm -hmm. and consider triangular surface codes that ah. uh, Yoder and Kim have uh, discussed. 
And uh, these codes, in fact, have an X edge, a Y edge, and a Z edge. And you can do these direct Y measurements on there. And in fact, they use fewer qubits than a square lattice uh, surface code. And it might even be comparable to the color code. So uh, if you like Majoranas and you like surface codes, why not consider triangular surface codes as your medium for interacting between the two? Um, yeah, you can definitely do that. I mean, um, triangular codes reduce your, your overhead to three quarters. So they're basically the same as, as the 666 color code. Um, it's just that I haven't found a clever way of arranging these qubits so that you have actually access to all sides. Because if you have, if you have, if you take this triangular code, well, then you have a Z edge, an X edge, and a Y edge. But in lattice surgery, you need access to all of these sides of the triangle. So you need to leave some free space around, around the qubit to be able to access it. I think the way, um, in the original paper, the way they got around that is by, by investing time in operations that rotate the triangle. Anymore. So in the end, I think you're still left with some space overhead. But um, yeah, it's worth checking out. <laughs> we'll take two more questions for those of you over there. We've got your hands up. Hi, thanks for the nice talk. You mentioned that you don't need ancillas to measure stabilizers with Majoranas, um, but it seems plausible that when you measure higher weight stabilizers, also not with an ancilla, that they will be mm -hmm. a lot noisier than low weight ones. Have, is this something you've thought of? Does this put you off at all? So there's definitely a, um, a physical limit to, to measuring uh, non-local stabilizer operators. And um, it's just that they don't scale that badly. Um, for instance, there are implementations. Okay, he here you have to be careful that you don't uh, form these loops that are that are longer than some coherence length. In other implementations, you uh, you find that with increasing the number of Majoranas you want to measure simultaneously, you require finer and finer precision in the gate voltage. So there are physical limits. Um, but I would argue that if you already have a system that can measure four qubit stabilizers, then it's not much more difficult to measure six qubit stabilizers. And the last, last question. Um, so I was wondering, um, back to the page on the, the log S scaling. Um, uh -huh. So your surface code is a 2D lattice. Um, and you say that to implement the long range C naught, it takes a logarithmic overhead in the distance S between target and control. Um, but the Lee Robinson bound uh, says that if you have like nearest neighbor interactions, um, then it should take linear overhead um, in order to implement a C naught over the distance S. Do you have any idea how to reconcile these facts? I don't know if that's actually related because uh, what you do is you, in the first step, you prepare a highly entangled state. So in the end, all you're doing is mm. teleportation. Oh, uh, okay. And, um, well, teleportation is exempt from that, I guess. Okay. Because Got you it. use entanglement. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's thank Daniel once more for an excellent talk.